<laughs> do a little little stretching. All right, so sadly, I do not have any delicious rebel grown flour uh, to smoke. I am rocking the t-shirt, which my <laughs> uh, two year old wiped. Uh, she had chocolate on her mouth and she decided to wipe it in my shoulder, but uh, about right. I'm smoking some Boglin Afghan land race. So, Dan, welcome. It's been a long time since we've seen you on the FCP YouTube. Too long. Right. Hopefully we'll be a little more regular going forward. Yeah. But uh, actually, let me just start this over on... The other side. So we'll have uh, some people joining us, hopefully, who have uh, grown Rebel Grown <laughs> genetics and smoked Rebel Grown. But why don't we... Uh, so the seeds have been a long time coming, right? We've talked about this for a long time. So you want to kind of talk about the seed journey? Yeah, well, you know, uh, it depends on where you want me to start, you know, for this this last year, you know, what I've, what I've done historically is, you know, I harvest seeds mostly outdoors in the fall. And usually, you know, my seed release date used to always be the Emerald cup. So mid December used to be the kind of target goal to have everything packaged up and, you know, sorted through and kind of graded out. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, this year I was just kind of waiting on designing labels and, you know, we made a lot of different things this year. So there was a lot of organization. Um, but yeah, yeah, I got you some seeds and excited to kind of, kind of walk through what's there and, you know, tell people what, what we got going on. Yeah. I'm just grabbing the, uh, so here's the, the packaging, you yeah. know? Yep. So why don't, um, like your would you call it like your signature, uh, your award-winning line that put you on the map? You want to start there? Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't really, you know, it's not exactly how I see it. Um, right. I first started making seeds, you know, in Vermont back in 2008, 2009, just some kind of experimental stuff. And when I moved to California, and started doing a lot of kind of seed making and doing a lot of selections and then eventually kind of started a, a seed company. There was kind of like a few main staples that were like the, the backbone of, of a lot of the lines. And um, my, I guess my whole theory was, you know, going back around then, <clears throat> you know, I came from the East Coast, really understanding the kind of wholesale market and also understanding like the connoisseur market. So. You know, I was aware what people in New York and Boston were paying, you know, for sour diesel and black haze and small batch organic indoor. And I was also aware of what they were paying for the the commercial, you know, outdoor that was produced in the north, um, you know, in the beasters. So I really had, a, I think, a good understanding of where the market was, you know, on the wholesale level and the retail level, but also on the kind of high grade connoisseur level. And uh, when I went out to California, um, you know, a lot of people make a, a journey out to California or out West, you know, seeking medical or, or legal weed. And without kind of realizing where I was ending up, I ended up in the Mecca of cannabis. So, you know, in terms of the Emerald Triangle, which is a pretty big region, I ended up in a, a subdivision, you know, one small fire district that's, you know, one of the most kind of legendary places <clears throat> for, um, you know, for just really cool lifestyle and interesting people, but also for cannabis culture and just, you know, cannabis farming and, and growing weed as, as kind of like a, a way of life and a profession. And so because of that, you know, I was able to kind of combine my experience with both markets where like a lot of people, I think they get a taste of one or the other. You know, you're you're working for an outdoor farmer. This is what you know. You're working for an indoor grower. This is what you know. But I had a lot of insight, I think, into the the wholesale, the retail, the connoisseur, you know, the indoor, the outdoor cultivation on, on both coasts. I, I had a really good understanding of that market. Um, and so when I started making seeds more intentionally and doing selections, the whole point was I don't want to have the same shit that everybody else has because everybody else has the same shit unless this one circle has this and they're able to utilize that. Uh, at the time, I also saw like, you know, for most growers, it was a business. And even though I use it to support myself, I never really looked at it as a business. 
So I saw a lot of business models of, oh, I've got this cut and I'm making money off it and I get a good price. So why would I share it with you? And that was kind of the opposite of how I felt, you know, um, in the East Coast before moving to California, whenever I'd grow seeds and find a really nice clone selection, I made sure to give it all, all to my friends that grew, you know. And so anybody that I knew that was growing weed back in the day, I would try to hook them up with lights, hook them up with soil mixes, hook them up with cloning techniques, hook them up with seeds and clones, you know, do whatever I could to help them be more successful at growing. And so it's kind of um, <clears throat> where I ended up in Humboldt and when I was able to do that, I think it's it's just uh, it was a cool experience to just see a different side of the country's wholesale commercial market from the largest organic growers, you know, probably in the country at the time. And also seeing all the indoor grows, you know, back in the day um, in Arcata, every single house was pretty much an indoor. And there was this one show on like whatever Discovery Channel that called like Arcata, like, you know, Pot City USA. Uh, but that that's really how it was. So everybody that I ever met was either an indoor grower or an outdoor grower. And for every one of those people trying to support themselves growing cannabis, it was really important to have good genetics. And I realized a lot of people didn't understand what good genetics were. They might just be growing what someone gave them or what the guy who was selling clones had. Um, and so I, I really kind of used all those uh, thoughts when I started combining genetics. How can I find something that's unique and special to me that's not the same shit everyone else has, something that's different? And then how do I do enough experimentation and R&D to find something that's really stand out? Because, you know, just because you find something good in a pack of seeds doesn't mean that it's going to be good enough that anybody's going to be impressed with it. Hey, what's up, Tyson? Um, so anyway, so that's that's a little background to kind of the origins of, of what I started doing. And I guess it, it turned into seed company, you know, unintentionally. Um, and so in recent years, you know, we've gotten a lot of credit and Leafly features and awards for the double OG chem. Um, but previous to that, I had other things that were top sellers to different farmers and growers around Humboldt County. And, <clears throat> and what I've really tried to do is take these different lines, you know, like, the first year that I was very comprehensive with breeding was was probably 2011. <clears throat> I made like, you know, over 70, 80 different kind of hybrids. And then it's the next year's testing through those to find out which combinations worked because some of them didn't work very good at all. Um, but when I would grow something out that I had made that ended up really standing out and being able to work that, <clears throat> what I've done over the last, I guess, 14 years now is try to do line breeding with those and work on basically just a combination of preservation and improvement at the same time. And uh, <clears throat> sorry. And that's kind of a trick in its own because when you're doing the preservation runs, there's a lot of open pollinations that are done, even when, when you are selecting males down. And so you're trying to pass off as much diversity and as many traits as possible while maybe excluding some of the weaker ones, um, which leaves a lot of room for finding a ton of different variety in a line. And um what I've really done with a lot of these seeds in the last four years is say, okay, I've, I've preserved a lot of these things that I've worked for generations and I know them really well. I know everything in there. Now, now that they're preserved, I want to go into them and I want to fix some of the things that I don't like and start to narrow down traits and find like the best flavors, the best, you know, plants to grow. Um, so that's what I've been doing the last four years is more selecting for, you know, specific traits that I liked, whether it be, you know, a flavor or a color or a flower structure or resistance to something. Can, can you, I, I love examples. Can you give an example of something that, you know, from a couple of years ago to now, like what specifically you were doing and your tactics and strategies for doing it? Sure. Yeah. Like a perfect, a perfect one to mention would be this, what I call the Island Mountain headband. So when I first got to California, the first farm that I worked on, one of my first jobs was leafing, you know, a garden of, of headband. So, you know, there was a bunch of gardens. Headband was the, I think, the clone they had the most of on the farm. I did a lot of leafing it. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> I noticed a lot of farms were growing a ton of headband. Headband was really great at the time because um, a lot of people just had buyers from L.A. and they only wanted OG Kush. And so there were some people that were like, I can't grow anything but OG Kush my buyers won't buy it unless it's OG. If you sell somebody OG seed and it doesn't smell like OG Kush, they're not going to sell their weed that year. Uh, but the thing is the OG clones, you know, they're not very vigorous. So you can't grow no five or six pound plant of an OG Kush clone. So the guys that I knew who grew OG were going in small pots 
and raised beds. And even their raised beds were kind of like thin and, and narrow beds. They weren't very big. And uh, but they could get top dollar for it. And um, and then there were guys who had sour buyers, you know, and with sour, you can grow these pretty big, robust plants. But in order for them to develop flavors, well, you know, you got to take them into November and you have a really long extended season, which means you're starting to trim later. Um, and so headband, I thought it was a perfect balance, you know, like it, it, you know, I was just told it was an OG sour hybrid. There's a lot of OG sours floating around at the time. But headband was to me, it was like the perfect in between the OG and the sour where it was vigorous and you could grow a good size full season plant. Um, it finished earlier than the sour diesel and it was such a gassy, you know, nose and tasted so good that you could sell it to an OG or a sour diesel buyer. They wouldn't know the difference and tell people from LA that it's OG, tell people from New York it's sour. No, nobody's going to know. And, um, I guess over the years, you know, the next ver version that you saw similar to that was like a sour band, which was back crossed to a sour diesel that was longer flowering. And then the three Kings, which is another story. Um, but I, I started making some outcrosses with headband in 2011 and through different years and generational selections had back crossed it to the headband clones, um, you know, and started in crossing it. And so what I did, you know, I'll, I'll send you this picture, actually, because I meant to send you this like back in 2015 or 2016. I did an indoor run um, just to make some seeds of an open pollination from it. And so what I did was I selected like a handful of males from like 100 seeds that I thought were like the most vigorous, you know, standout males that were really going to be awesome. Your 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 number is 917. Is that you? Um, I'm going to text you this picture. So anyway, so I selected these males. I did an open pollination uh, to all the seed plants, and I also back crossed it to the, the headband clone. <clears throat> and when I grew those seeds out and started offering the seeds, they were big, aggressive, growing, vigorous plants. But the nose was less gassy headband, big, chunky buds, frosty, potent, everything that you could want. But the nose to me was more like a musky or like a gym socks or what I call the Pepto-Bismol terp. And it, you know, you had to grow through a whole bunch of plants to find that real gassy, you know, uh, terp. And so I, I hadn't really grown out those seeds or done a breeding run since, since 2016 from these males that I just sent you. And you can see the males, they're beasts, you know, they're super aggressive, just pollinating. Uh, the only thing in the hoop at the time was some little headband clones, but the mistake was instead of choosing the lankier, more stretchy males that would have had more dominant traits of the headband, I chose these real sturdy ones because they were just so impressive. And so years later in 2020 and 2021, I started growing out those older back cross F3 lines from the male selections that I sent you. And over the last four years, I've been basically only, I've been doing open pollinations, but selecting the more lanky plants that are more stanky. I've been kind of using the the notes that I have old pictures of headband clones trying to match up the leaf structure. And, you know, the first year that I did open pollination, I only kept seeds from two females because out of 30 plus females, there were only two that were exactly what I want someone to get when I tell them it's headband. So four years later from those, you know, F3s of the back cross line, I now have it where like, if you grow the seeds out, you're getting gassy headband. Um, yeah, so those are the males that I was talking about that are, look, they're super chunky and it was a great open pollination, um, but it, it it was great for preservation, but it it didn't pass the traits in a dominant way that I'd hoped. <clears throat> so I spent the last years, four years doing selections to correct that. And now what's great is we have some production clones, a real proven winner, um, and, and some others that we're still testing that are just crazy, incredible flavors. And um and yeah, yeah, I'm really stoked about these seeds. And uh, we we did kind of like a soft launch of the F5s. Um, so the F4, the, the F5s, I was selling some of them last year and people grown them out. And now we have the, the F6 line, which is what you have. And um, they're good, they're good. I think people are gonna be stoked. I, you know, Skunk Tech, you know, my buddy Skunk Tech's got some real good, you know, headband line reversals. Um, one especially that he's just been posting or getting ready to release that looks like real good old school sour diesel traits but aside from that and maybe some karma stuff i don't think anybody's got these kind of gassy terps yeah and just quickly i want to uh tyson joined us and uh tyson i don't have any pride of asking questions or anything so if you want to 
ever jump in because you're curious about something or have a question, but did, did you grow the Island Mountain Head or what specifically, what did you grow from Rebel Grown? Um, so I've grown Starlink. I've grown um, Double OG Cam, Rebel Cookies, um, Lemon Sugar Kush, Supernova, and Natty Bumpo. Those are the, the six I've, I've grown. It's a good list. <laughs> that was good. Yes, and I I, I, I was happy with all of them. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, when yeah. when we got together in Connecticut, I think everyone would uh, unanimously say that uh, that Tyson's flower was the uh, bell of the ball. Right. That's kind of how I felt when I met Tyson in a event of everybody showing me their herb. So, makes sense. And Travis, you can only ask that question if you come on with us. <laughs> Timing and genetics, do you foresee a rise of rebel grown with gas terp demand outpacing supply right now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, my whole thing is that uh, in some ways I had a head start and made a lot of pretty incredible things happen in a short period of time and you know, use the opportunity to kind of focus on the things that I that I wanted to do personally. Um, but looking back on the evolution of legal weed, you know, I'm, I'm kind of slept on a little bit. And that's that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm a private person. Um, but, you know, like our double OG cam at the Emerald Cup won first place in the sun grown category last year. Uh, that that's a big deal to me because I really love the Emerald Cup. I love what it stands for, the people behind it, the community it brings out. And uh, I've been trying to win that that award, you know, for over a decade, and we've come close, we've had second place and second place and seventh place and 12th place and 16th, all, all that shit. But, you know, so double OG Chem won one first place at the Emerald Cup, and it also won the Breeders' Cup. Um, the Breeders' Cup just means that whoever came closest to first place and actually bred or made the seeds of that variety. So you can win the Breeders' Cup in second or third place if the people ahead of you didn't didn't breed what they won with. Um, but the double OG chem has won three breeders cups, which nothing else ever has. And it's the same clone. It was a seed plant in 2018 and a clone in, in 2022, 2023. Um, well, what people don't know is that our other double OG chem cut was also winning these awards. Plus I gave it to some other farms. So, you know, our genetics won four out of the top 10 in 2022 and three out of the top 10 in 2023. And there's just not a lot of people who grow them, you know? People buy seeds online for me, but it's not like it was. There was a time 2011 through 2017 where I was just cranking out a lot of seeds. So a lot of people, mostly in Northern California and, you know, other places were, were getting a taste of our genetics and growing a lot of our seed. But so, yeah. And, and like I was saying before, my whole thing is I don't think that my genetics are better than anyone else's. It's just that my palate and my interpretation of what I'm looking for. I'm trying to find the best herb that I can find covering different spectrums and flavors and genres of cannabis. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people, what they get in the market is what they're led to take. It's what's shoved down their throats or what's marketed towards them. Um, but overall consumers are pretty smart and over time they figure out going to the stores, what's actually good. And generally when people try our weed that we grew, it's, it's really strong compared to a lot of stuff that's out there and the flavor profiles are just, uh, what used to be the most special best shit that everybody wanted. And now very few people have. So, so yeah. yeah. You know, can, can you quickly I'm, talk about your palate? Like, what are you, I mean, I, I know, but you want to. Yeah. Uh, I, I think weed a, a lot of the time, you know, it's like there's, there's climate, there's genetics and there's, you know, skill or technique. And uh, a lot of, this is something I wanted to mention. Like, there's so much talk about THC this and like people shop for THC and yes, consumers are uninformed and misled and miseducated. So a lot of them go into stores and they ask what's the strongest shit they buy on THC. But here's one other way of looking at that. Most modern cannabis is capable of having a pretty crazy amount of cannabinoids and terpenes. And it's really about the grower. So it's like when I look at a strain of modern cannabis, and I see that it tested at 17% THC. It's it's not that I'm trying to get the best THC. I just think that if the grower had maybe not had heat stress or if they had given it another 
five days or if, if they had more experience, maybe that 17 percent probably just would have been 23 percent. You know, it's like when you see Terps for sale on anything under two percent, like I, I think that that's just how it was grown and how it was dried and, and cured and, and stored. Because, you know, when I when I have genetics that are testing at three and four percent Terps and I already know that I didn't store it or cure it or dry it any way near what could have been correct. Those would have been five or six percent Terps. So, um, you know, I, I think that all the talk of, of the THC, it's like it's unfortunate that's the way the market goes. However, you know, really strong growers who are really good at what they do, their stuff generally tests pretty good. And it has less to do with the genetics, I think, than it has to do with the skill of the grower um, and, and the climate. Yeah, I mean, it, it for me, like, I'm so oblivious to kind of the, like, my world is kind of all of you guys and everyone in the chat where, like, none of us care about numbers. It's just like, <laughs> do I like it, right? right. Um, but uh, we all, sorry, I, I'm getting, I'm realizing that I'm pretty high right now. But uh, <laughs> that's why we have Chef Alex joining us. Medicine's working. <laughs> it is working. What's up, Alex? What's going on, Dan? How you doing, man? Good. Well, yeah. so what I will say about my genetics is back in the day, I'd, I'd never had anything tested until 2010. In 2010, the guy that I was working for tested our best weed. It was 18% CBD, <laughs> you know? And That's uh, amazing. Anyway, what, what, what was that? It was, oh, geez. This was a blackberry and blueberry and grapefruit hybrid and all types of stuff like that. Some old school Humboldt genetics and also stuff that came from Vancouver Island in Canada. Um, it was a blackberry blueberry hybrid. Um, but either way, um, when I started testing my stuff, you know, I, I tested it through entering competitions because the dispensaries that I was selling it to, they weren't, they weren't testing it themselves. You know, it's like we grew organic weed with like compost teas and very minimal inputs, but like I'd never had anything tested until 2010, 2011. And so the OG chem clone, which is the mother of, a, uh, was that, was that Kevin? What up, Kevin? I was just going to tell a story. Kevin's like in, involved in a lot of my stories, but. Uh, Let, let's see it. Let's so, see if Kevin uh, is, is babysitting small kids or if he can jump on for a second, but tell the story. Well, yeah. So the OG chem, when it was tested by the Emerald cup was 28% THC and testing was so new for most growers that very few people had ever seen anything as potent as 28%. And so that got a lot of recognition because you know, it was something that could pass off as an OG or a chem that was really, really gassy. And it's like, you know, we tested that out and gave it to a bunch of indoor growers and a bunch of outdoor growers with a bunch of other OG chems. And that one, that that high testing was really influential in the market because back then most OG was only 22, 23, like perfectly grown OG can be 24, 25, 26. And so it's like, I, I feel I can look at herb and generally tell you what the THC is by just gazing at it and seeing how dense the trichomes are, the size of the heads and, and all that shit. But, uh, you know, it was, it was impactful to have something that people noticed was, was so strong. I gave that clone to Kevin and it kind of created its own kind of thing. People called it all types of different names, but like thousands and thousands and thousands of, of people were growing that as like, that was their bread and butter paying the bills because it got you so high and it was so beautiful. Um, and the double OG chem that won those Emerald Cups is a descendant from that mom that I planted, you know, and, you know, whatever, 14 years ago, um, just worked a bunch of generations and stopped with a few plants that have the right flavor and the right, you know, um, a lot of other boxes that you would check. Sorry, let me quickly go to where are you? Yeah, so Tyson, you said you said you grew this out too. Yes. Yeah, that was that that was my my favorite. I think that well, that and the Natty Bumpo, those those two. Um, but yeah, the dot the dot. Yeah, I, awesome. I think Owen mentioned the Natty Bumpo. It was an excellent grow. The natty, the natty's cool. And if you grow more than like two or three females of the natty bumpo, you're going to find something really good. And it's like, 
um, yeah, yeah, I've been making a bunch of seeds and doing different, you know, generations. And we, we have a couple clones of it here. We have a couple clones of it in Humboldt. Yeah, actually, can you talk? I mean, because you're in two vastly different, I mean, not, they're kind of, what is it, latitude, right? Is this way and longitude is that way? Like latitude, they're a little similar, but East Coast, West Coast. Can you talk about growing, like anything you've particularly noticed? different expressions of the same stuff in Vermont versus Humboldt? Yeah. Well, you know, when I, when I moved out to California, you know, I showed up with East coast weed, you know, so I, I brought my last indoor, my last outdoor harvest. And I was like, all right, when I meet some growers, I'm going to show them my weed. And like, hopefully they're going to be like, damn. And that, that's, that's kind of what happened. But um, I used to tell all the California people that the East coast has really great terpene production. And I would always just tell people that my assumption was that we just have so much moisture here during a certain time of the year. You know, once you hit September and, um, you know, even in, in August, you know, like in California, you know, in Humboldt, in my neighborhood, like August can be 114 degrees and bone dry and the air can be stale. There's this this smell that you can get, not a bad smell, but there's just the smell of like the oak trees and the dried leaves and what you get that time of year, but there's very little moisture when cannabis begins to flower. And then going into September, you know, it's like we're, we have this unique microclimate where we get moisture that comes from these creeks that's brought in from the Eel river. Um, but it's, it's dry. And the highest terps that I've ever grown in California is about four and a half percent terpenes and three, when you hit 3%, we've done an excellent job on the East coast. We're still kind of dialing in our cultivation here in Vermont, figuring out, you know, everything that we want to do to grow the best herb, the best way. But like we're, we're hitting like 3%, you know, 4%, four and a half plus percent terpenes, um, it, you know, giving our best effort, but in, in a, a, in a situation that's by no means dialed in. And so I think the East coast has better terpene production for that reason, just that we have dew on the ground and we have moisture and we have rain, you know, in August and September. So the right East coast, fall season can have a beautiful, beautiful finish and flavors. A, a couple of years ago, I wanted to send some of my Vermont Starlink to the to California. And I was going to secretly enter it in the Emerald Cup because I, I really mm -hmm. thought we could have won with it because it was it was just so terpy and beautiful um, and held the color well. So that's just the main difference that I notice is it's easier to produce terpenes, I think, correctly outdoors on the East Coast. There, there are mm -hmm. a lot of Go ahead, Alex. I just wanted to touch on that. And then earlier when you were mentioning the terpene production, um, I think that, you know, even you hitting those numbers, what you are doing are on the high side of what's being seen for average. I just saw this post that I pulled up from MCR Labs in Mass. Um, and for the flower report for January, um, they had the cannabinoids and the terpene um, averages and highest and what they were seeing for highest submitted was uh 3.48 percent and the average was um looks like just under two so um but is that isn't that mostly indoor weed that's true too yeah and it's um if it's on the market it's also remediated as well if that affects the terpenes right do you know that lab i used to uh I used to do this thing with this dude, Scott, from that lab back in the yeah. day when it first opened up. Yeah, Scott's still, he's the chief scientific officer for, um, okay, for cool. the lab still. Yeah, he runs, I think, Massachusetts and has some sort of oversight in their main lab, too. Nice. There used to be um, a weed school called the Northeastern Institute of Cannabis. It was a vocational training school for people <laughs> in mass that wanted to get into the medical industry as whatever, find their place. And it was, it was founded by Mickey Martin, who, if you don't know, was an activist, um, founded Parents for Pot. He was a Bay Area weed dude that was really involved in Oaksher Dam and worked with Richard Lee back in the day and wrote some some interesting books. And he tragically passed away. But he just randomly founded that weed school in Massachusetts. And so I, I taught cultivation there uh, when I was back here when we just, you know, first had a kid. And um, but anyway, Scott was the science teacher at that school. That's really cool, man. Yeah, they did a um, 
a collaboration at Harvard University Science Center this past year and the year before that. Uh, John and I went to the first year. He went uh, this past year at, uh, they were doing, um, it was called the cannabis, the cannabis science fair and MCR was doing um, experiments on terpenes in the sun last year. Uh, this year they had a different panel that I missed out on, but yeah, they're doing, they're doing some good work. Scott's a pretty awesome guy. Nice. Yeah. yeah terpene man, what, preservation. You know, I, um, I talked to Alex Dixon, um, a really cool dude. And he's a co-founder of, of SC labs, um, which obviously has, has done a lot of kind of pioneer, um, R and D on, on terpene analysis. And, uh, I forget what it was. And he was like, you know, I know your weed, Dan. And I, when we see it, you know, I, I get excited about it. He's, we really love your weed. He's like, he's like, I know how you're, you're an off grid farm in Humboldt. He's like, if you were able to have a dialed in, you know, drying facility, he's like weed like that. When we see weed should be five or 6% terpenes, but you know, the way that it's being handled and, you know, the best weed that I ever grow, you know, I, we harvest it one in the morning, you know, at least four hours after the sun goes down and cool weather. There he is. What's up, Kev? It's the <laughs> Amish superstar. <laughs> no, no, the semi-Amish now. I, I had to turn it back. <laughs> you're, you didn't go, you're not full Amish anymore. No, I, I was, you know, I was digging it too, but I just never had a beard so wide. So I didn't know how to shape it and I screwed it up when I was shaping it. So I wiped it out. And then I just uh, I, I I went beardless for a while, and I think I might I think I might blow back out again. Nice go. Uh, who who's who's the guy in the white lab coat? Where you got you guys know who I'm talking about? The nutrient guy. The he's like on YouTube a lot. Uh, someone in the chat, help me out. Anyway, you you Dan, you were telling a, a Kevin story earlier. Was that Bruce bugging me? I've good. I've lost yeah. Him. No, not not Bruce. Not Bruce. Uh, Harley. Harley. Oh, Harley. Harley Elmore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have the 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 fuzzy chin strap. <laughs> uh, so how y'all doing? Good. 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 Hanging in Chopping there. Chopping it up on some Rebel Grown OG. Nice, nice. Are, are you, yeah, that's right. All your new releases are dropping, huh? Yeah, you know, there's there's stuff that's always around, but you know, I wanted to get some some things over to Peter. He's got some stuff that nobody's gotten their hands on yet. What's exciting to you? Um, well, I was just talking about bringing back the headband, but you know, I took that line that was really preserved and really refined it, and spent four years getting rid of all the terps I didn't want and have it real dominant to like the real deal old school headband cut, mm -hmm. uh, just like real awesome sour OG flavors, and then. There's this one that I have that's kind of experimental. Um, I feel like some of the people who watch your show would probably like this. Back in the day, um, when I used to get a lot of weed in the Northeast, there was this cut Adirondack gold that I got um, this is 24, 25 years ago. And it was just kind of like really vibrant, orange, beautiful herb. And we used to get all this Friesland and what we called Jerry Berries back in the, back mm -hmm. in the day, which was old school. It was Canadian grown, beautiful herb, Christmas tree weed, all that stuff. But the Adirondack gold really stood out. And then I heard nothing about it for a bunch of years. And there were these old skunk varieties back in the day that I remember getting at Reggae Fest. There was a skunk A and a skunk B and some real cool land race stuff that old timers, you know, around here had. And I always figured the Adirondack gold and all that stuff was just old skunks that got different names. And uh, however many years ago, geez, 20... 16 uh, a buddy of mine was like hey i have a friend that grows weed and he just quit smoking but he said that you could use his uh two light grow space and make seeds in it if you you know throw him some some bread and he's like that's one of the adirondack gold dudes and uh so i gave them uh, a double og sour mail and put it in a two lighter that had the adirondack gold and a bunch of other stuff and i never really grew those adirondack gold seeds until i was back here on the east coast and you know had a chance to test them out and we're, you know, Owen and I are still still figuring it out. But, you know, I've come to the conclusion that it's I believe it's like some old skunk line. And obviously it's early finishing and, um, you know, cross with the double OG sour makes it like denser and, and more vigorous and pretty easy. to grow. And I did some pretty restrictive open pollinations where like I found sweeter, earthier stuff just didn't keep it. And just like one or two plants that I was like, that's eye watering skunk smell. 
And um, so we've got the F3s of it now. We've got a couple of clones that we're testing for keeping. And what I did on the open pollination, you know, the last couple of years is every seed plant gets put in a paper bag. <clears throat> I go through it and I just write all the notes on the bag. You know, do I like the color, the turp, the resin? Is it resistant? If it molds, it's going on the bag, right? And then when we sell the seeds, they get the ones that say resistant, turp, resin production, whatever. And so, um, <clears throat> so I wouldn't call this line fully tested, although we did test one of the moms indoor and it threw like a, a couple balls, but it was still some, some nice looking chunky, chunky herb. And that, that's not the keeper one, but, uh, so I, I refined it and, uh, put out an F3. I'm calling it Saganku skunk. And, um, you know, I was thinking about it, the Adirondacks, and I wanted to know what is the, what's the, the native indigenous, you know, tribes that lived in that area, what did they call skunk? And the word was Saganku and the, the English word skunk, you know, partially comes from that. And so that's the, the Abnaki, uh, the Huron and the Algonquin and the uh, Abnaki, which is kind of native to Vermont. Um, I have, a uh, a really good friend of mine from back in the day, his parents last Indigenous Peoples Day, they gifted, they did a legal transfer and they gave 350 acres back to this local Abnaki tribe. Um, and I brought my daughters to this ceremony. It was this really incredible moment. And so what I decided, I just thought that all connected, old school skunk, Adirondack gold, Abnaki, Sagonku skunk. So I call it Sagonku skunk. And I... I can't say it's fully tested, but from what I've experienced, there's some really skunky stuff in there that I think is what a lot of people are looking for. I think when they find a lot of that old skunky stuff, it's not always going to be the types of plants that they want to grow compared to modern cannabis. So it's for someone who wants to search for an old school skunk um, and, um, and grow out some plants and try to find something special in it. And then what I was going to do is take 10% of all the proceeds that come from it and I'm going to give it to the Abnaki tribe that's, you know, 20 minutes from here uh, because that 350 acres has an old maple barn, an old sugar bush. And so they want to revitalize that and start sugaring and using the land for the tribe. And um, so I was going to reach out to them. I told, told my friend and his family and they thought it was a great idea. So Saganku Skunk, Adirondack Gold, Double OG Sour F3 and 10 percent of whatever proceeds from seeds or flour that's grown you know, forever are going to go to that local Abnaki tribe. Oh, that's awesome. I, lo I love that. Me too. I, I was going to say we should, I'd love to get involved with that. And I'm sure a lot of the people in the community would too. If you want to do something where we do like a fundraiser for them and that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Well, you know, what I've been doing is, you know, there's so many things I always wanted to do and I just never had enough resources. I'm just trying to, <clears throat> you know, sell weed and grow weed and, and get paid and, and survive and, you know, keep things going. But, you know, I've only grown my own genetics for a lot of years <clears throat> and we grow other people's stuff, but very minimally. And I don't think that my stuff is better than other people. So I've been really focusing on the last few years is popping seeds from friends of mine that are really reputable breeders who have really incredible ideals. Um, and then it just happens that Owen, you know, who's here and pretty much runs the day to day of the farm, like has a crazier seed collection than anybody and knows all the obscure breeders that are like friends of mine that have incredible stuff. Um, and so what I really want to do, man, to make weed more interesting is have my rebel grown stuff and, you know, my genetics. But when we grow other people's genetics, I want to have a cause for it all the time, like a, a real organic story like this is my homie and I grew his genetics and he's got a great story. So I can put it in a collab with his brand in this market or put these seeds in a collab and be like, let's get some awareness to how cool your story is and the origin of this variety, make a better story that's more entertaining, have quality, and then kick 10% to a cause that they care about. You know, we start with the seeds and then we can do the flower production and have skews in fucking legal stores, maybe in, both states or whatever. And then if that works, maybe we grow 20 pounds of it next year. But in the future, maybe we grow 400 pounds a year of Saganku skunk and everybody loves it, you know? So um, I want to do that with genetics, with, with just friends of mine, people that I'm cool with, just like music. Like you do a song with someone that you're cool with, not to just like get their awareness and promotion, but your friends. So you make music together and then you share it with people and you both get credit and recognition and bring awareness and, you know, bring something good from it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I, I want to, I'd love to do 
a, like a lot more fundraisers, but it's kind of like, and by the way, just because everyone's watching right now and I'm, I'm on the topic, it, if there's anybody who would love to like manage fundraisers, my, my biggest issue is it always falls on me. And so like, we'll do a fundraiser and then like there are winners and there are people with the seeds and like, I'm the one who has to connect everyone and like <laughs> people space out and people get angry and everyone like comes and I'm like, if there's anybody who would want to <laughs> manage a fundraiser, like be like, I'll take ownership of, cause there are so many things we could be raising money for and we do a really good job <laughs> when we do it, which is kind of cool. Uh, so anyway, that's my, before I forget, uh, just throwing that out there to everyone. And, and, and are you, are you talking about like Jesse and pe like, can you talk about some of the people who's, whose stuff you love to, or you're, you're excited to explore? Yeah. So there's Jesse, there's Jackson, there's a uh, Ben at Emerald mountain. Um, I really like, uh, Nick from uh, green, green source. And we've been playing with his genetics, uh, a, a lot. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a couple others. Um, and um and that's that's what's it just makes it more fun you know like the whole point of weed is always to like not just grow weed and grow the whatever it's not just about having like a factory or a process like having fun with it and uh when you're so far away from people you know um in different places these collaborations i think are, are really fun and make it exciting for me you know that's the stuff i get excited about well, it's, it's positive too because a lot of times you can drag somebody forward. So whoever's got the reach is got is got the reach. And if you're able to bring in people with less recognition but quality attributes, it's it's fucking epic. You know, right. it's like it's the it's what everybody in life wants. You want to be able to be able to come up from your work. And the world is kind of hard. It's not really fair like that. And so when you got a when you got a, an ability to say, hey, we could do some work together, and then you can highlight it and bring it forward. I just think what it does is it shows other people that it's possible and that it doesn't diminish you by by working collaboratively, which in our in our industry really do, doesn't really fly that well. But actually, it's the only way you can move forward. Yeah, I, I totally agree, man. And um, yes, yeah, absolutely. Mark from Green Shock is another one. You know, it's like uh, Mark is one of, in my opinion, I think he's one of the best growers in Northern California. You know, yeah, Mark's bad. He's From what I know, about him, he's uh -huh. grown, in, grown in over a dozen counties over 25 years. And, yeah. you know, his herb is noticeably standout. And um, but I, I, gave him, I gave him some seeds of the double OG cam and he found a nice mail that he put into the Green Lantern, which not that many people have. And then he gave me some of those seeds. And then we found some nice mails from the oh, Green Lantern double OG cam. And we crossed that back into the double OG cam, the Green Lantern and Jason's Ridgeline Runs Cuts. So that's like a cool collaboration. Like it's like a, it's a triangle of people, you know? Yeah. 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 And all three of you are well known. So it, 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 but it's the same idea that you're working together to do shit. And it, you, you kind of, sometimes you have to form communities in, in a bigger sphere than the normal community. Like cannabis community really to me is global where you can like, you can tap in and work around the world. So you get the benefit of it. Otherwise it does. It just gets fucking dry. You lose you lose your, your love of the craft when it's nothing but this grind and it's this grind culture of like, we're supposed to grind our way to some kind of fucking place in the future that will stop grinding. And I'm like, yeah, but I never intend to cook growing dope. So if I don't enjoy the process of growing dope, then what the fuck am I doing? Like it's, it's so anti actually why I'm here for, you know? Yeah. See that grind. That's, that's all I really know is that grind, but I've all, I believe that I've always had answers to how does the grind not become like that. And I just haven't gotten there because it's been so challenging with regulations as much foresight as you think you have, you don't fucking, you can't predict the future and how, no, how no. Different, you know, things are, but um, yeah, I just know that I, I spent, a, it's a better day for me if I spend it playing with my three-year-old than me doing some miraculous business fucking movement that I think is going to suddenly transform my future in a way that will, that will forever last. Because I've been grinding, like, I mean, if you know me, you know I've been milling corn. Like, I am definitely on a grindstone. Yeah. It's just that as I get older, I just started realizing, like, what the fuck am I doing this for? And and so much of herb was because I really enjoyed doing it. it and, and so, you know, that's why I like doing the collaborative work or, you know, even hopping on podcasts and stuff. 
it's just fun to hang out with your friends for a second and talk about the state of the world because you, you're people that you respect. Definitely. Yep. I try to find a balance and it's like, I'll go super hard and then I get burnt out. And, um, you know, if I take time off and spend time with my family, the more time you spend with your family, the less work you want to do. So it's always just hard to find, find that balance, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, when you're with the kids, you get to be a kid. And I'm lucky that I got young kids. So I get to <laughs> escape into the world of fantasy land and shit. And I'm, I'm serious. Like I really, <laughs> it, it, without it, I would never leave the workspace. Like I, I only know one way and, and the kids are kind of really teaching me, especially at my age now that like the moments I don't get with them now, I might not ever get. I, it isn't like you're going to get some time in the future. I'll be too fucking old. I'll be dead. Yeah. No, I, I love being with my kids all the time. I think we all got young kids. Like it's amazing. Yeah. 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 It's great, man. Makes life, makes life rich. Otherwise, like I said, the, the, the cannabis industry itself is a fucking disaster. And so you don't get any satisfaction out of it because what you're really doing is you're just staying alive and you're trying to be able to work in the craft of cannabis. And that's difficult because there's only so many lanes that you can monetize. And so you have to like minimize some of your, your developmental work to fit your reality. And it's just this balancing act you have to create so that you, you don't ever lose your, your love of what you do. You Kevin, know, like you can have another kid each decade. I could, I could. But, <laughs> you know, but the thing is, I'm, you're like I'm, Sisyphus. I'm, like I just got up the hill and then like rolls back had, down again. Yeah, no, I have relatives that had kids late, you know, in their fucking like late seventies and shit. But to me, that's not fair to the kid. And because really what I, what you want to be able to do is it, it, hopefully or ideally be able to be active with them in a way they need. And so when they're four years old, you need to be crawling under the table and pretending that you're a, a, a rabbit too. And when you're, when you're 80, you know, I don't see many 80 year olds crawling around <laughs> under the fucking table. So I just know that I wouldn't be able to give the kid what they need. And so I think that like, I'm at my limit right now of like functional, like I'll be able to ride this one out right. and, and I'll do it. So I got the full, you know, he'll be four in May. My daughter just turned 11. The granddaughter's two. My oldest son's 28. Wow, so crazy. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll be, I'll fuck, I'll be 58 in a couple months. Yeah, you're a young one, though. Yeah, my health is strong. Yeah, after I, after I survived that coma and, um, and came back from that, everything's been pretty good. But there was a couple years, probably a year and a half, almost two years following the coma, that I was like sucked fucking dry of like life. Like that shit robbed me of some life. And it took, it took, a, it, it took like the, uh, the practice of being healthy again, which I was prior. If I hadn't been so healthy, I would have died. But, the, you know, you have these bumps up and down in your, your life cycle that are unpredictable. You know, you can't really call them. And really what you find is just do the best you can to maintain, you know, a homeostasis as a human. And then you're able to kind of like find a balance and work towards it. But man, it's hard. And and the industry that I'm in, it fits me pretty well because I'm a fucking lunatic too. And so there's no stability in the industry to ever really allow you a, 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 a balance point from it. Where before cannabis was in a lot of regards, aside of some, you know, extreme tension, 99% of the time it was pretty stable. So it allowed you to be able to have like some normality there as well. So you could have one foot in the game that you're in and it was pretty good and one foot in your life. But when either one of them is moving like, you know, grease, it, it's uh, it's it's just it's hard to ever get your bearing. And I think yeah. for so many people, it's mentally unhealthy. And so for me, I just try to, like, you know, focus on why I'm doing what I'm doing and um, ride the fucking tide out and, and build and continue to work and build. But like, you know, the, the, the time off with the kid in the afternoon playing, let's pretend we're kittens today was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had to get my claw technique up a little bit better, though, and my, my cat impersonation isn't quite as gifted as the kid, but I'm learning. Th this was my two-year-old uh, earlier today. Very nice. <laughs> and that was a satisfying moment. Oh, yeah. No, because one of those photos there almost got me my kid taken away in 2002 it, where I had a photo of a kid in, 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 it was, and it was cannabis in the photo. 
And uh, they were they were trying to. I had to put fucking lawyers on that shit. It was a nightmare. So anytime I see normal family activities around the herb, I'm just statically happy because you can't hide your life from your kids and expect them to ever know who you are. Yeah, you know it's impossible. This duality shit where I only showed them what I wanted to show them. I'm like, well, yeah, they. I'm sure they fucking didn't miss anything. I'm sure that they weren't looking in the, in the grass. <laughs> so it's just easier to be you in real time. And that way, what it does, it lets them also be themselves. They don't, they don't fear, and they don't keep the lies the same either. They're more willing to show you who they are. But the more you hide, the more you teach people to hide, which was like the crime of us from the past, where we were so good at fucking hiding, it took years to normalize and come out in public. Some of us are still hiding. Yeah, yeah, no, not everybody's out in the fucking public, man. If I wasn't where I'm at in the time I was, I wouldn't have either. You know, so like I just knew that for me at, at the stage of my life, it was time to move forward because I knew there was no going back and I had the ability to create a defense. So it allowed me uh, uh, some room. I mean, a little bit of navigation room is critical. But for so many I know in, in, in U.S. and in other countries, fuck, man, you got to be putting a bag over your head and a sound detector and glasses so they don't fucking shoot your eyes. It's crazy. Like you go to the UK, man, they crawl up your ass with technology. A lot of cameras there. Woo! I mean, monitored, monitored in every detail. So the growers there are like extremely diligent about their patterns and their habits and all the little details that like we don't have to really worry about anymore where I live. No one gives a shit. Now herbs, fuck, you can, you can, you can walk around with weed. Dan, talk about uh, your music a little bit. Oh, man, uh, yeah, music's the other thing that I that I you know really like and spend a lot of time on. Um, besides weed, and I was always into music when I was a kid, and I I started doing hip hop stuff, you know, when I was fourteen, fifteen, and um, you know I used to be more of a freestyle rapper and kind of like a battle rapper, and um, you know. Um, but yeah, I've been, been writing music for a long time. I have a bunch of music and working tirelessly to, to release it, but never seem to be able to finish, but we're, we're close and I've got a, a pretty good catalog and some good features and good producers and, you know, we're real close. Now that that's odd. like music's kind of one of the things that I've put on pause for a lot longer than like, it makes me sad thinking about it. I used to love producing stuff and uh, I'm psyched that you're doing it. And I know like blue, like they're people, like I love hearing people being able to do a couple things that they're passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. The music, if all goes well, I'm going to actually release some and I want to find a way to kind of, you know, I, I kind of have a cheat code. Like I'm not, I'm not going out to clubs and like partying and getting my name out and rapping at parties every single night. Um, but, uh, but people know me for my weed kind of, and I write for some weed magazines and, you know, um, you know, it's, I don't want to be typecast as like a hip hop weed brand, but I think it'll be real cool to just kind of be able to use that platform, you know, release a song and make a blog, write a paragraph about what the song means when I wrote it put that on the rebel grown website and uh you know all i really want is for people to hear it and decide whether they like it i like it i make it for myself same with with weed i grow weed and and make seeds because it's what i like doing and what i like smoking the music kind of same deal um real close man that's what i was doing last night owen got these new speakers i'm in my studio right now and um you know owen got these new speakers that are nicer than my studio speakers so i was listening to all this this stuff we went through a lot last night, but uh, I'll send you something. That's cool. Yeah. Shit, I'm about to run out of battery, boys. So I'm gonna check out right now, man. Good to see Thanks you. Thanks for jumping on. Gas. Yep, pleasure. It's great seeing hours. you, Kev. Right nice on, baby. You, man. Are are you yeah. going to Nevada or no? No, I'm sticking around for a sec. I'm okay. just tired. Uh, some some time some time not traveling. I got it. I got invited to go and I really like Tyler. I think it'd be a, a fantastic event with um with the boys because it's just it's just really a, a a great group of people to be around but man if i if i could just have some home time without traveling yeah, yeah. Scat. so all right guys be good later kevin see ya later,
<laughs> Peter, I'm going to send you this one song. Nice. But yeah, yeah, my music, people don't really know about it because none of it's been released. <laughs> you know, but when I was younger, that's what I did. I would I would live in Vermont, I would grow weed, and then I'd get a little stir crazy of being in the woods, and I'd go to Boston to sell the weed. And you know, my routine was every night I'd get I had a CD case, like a old CD case, and just had all instrumentals on all these burn CDs. And I would just get some some beer and I'd bring whatever weed I had and I'd just go find college parties in Boston. And, you know, at a certain point during the night, I'll just put on beats and rap. And, uh, so it was, it was an everyday thing, you know, like, you know, music and um, and weed. Those are the two things, you know, you can play that song if you want. I'll text it to you. Yeah. I'm uh, trying to upload it. Hold on. Add music. Hold on. I'm trying to do this well. It's all good. I mean, you don't gotta play it, but uh, but yeah, no, I will be releasing some music. Um, I've been doing some shows, which was cool. Um, like a month ago in Vermont, I got to open up for the Jizza, and um, I did we did some cool stuff. I opened up for Lyrics Born. I opened up for uh, Capadonna. We did like a whole Wu Tang show in Vermont, like Rebel Grown, and this this dispensary that we work with here. They have a like a music venue. Um, so we, we had like a, a new year's party. So yeah, I've been doing like three, four shows a, a year, which is cool. And just getting back into the performing live. All right. So we have, uh, it uploaded. Here we go. How long is it? I do. You don't got to play the whole song, but if you want to give people just a perspective of, you know, yeah. like every, everything that I write is very autobiographical. So, you know, it's, it's, it's cool. Like I wrote this song, right. I recently went to check out some legal farms in New York and, um, you know, I was driving back from New York and I rolled a joint while I was driving. I liked the joint. And then all of a sudden I'm really high and I'm driving and I've got all this traffic to deal with. And I was like, what am I going to do with this time? And so I wrote the song while I was driving back, back to Vermont in a snowstorm. That's awesome. All right, here we go. Ready? <laughs> Can you hear that? It's probably a little quiet, but I should play. I'm in the studio. On the road, three states in the day, smoking the gasiest. Used to throw fists quick, now I'm a pacifist. Never had conflict, I couldn't handle farming in nature. I grow trees, chop them down and turn them to paper. I've got some haters now laughing at their jealous behavior. 300K in the bank on the low with 30 flavors. Smoke them each, every day of the week. Slaying the beat, I'm a beast with an appetite only for selling weed. 30 stores and I'm grinding like selling in the streets. Hand to hand, Dan the man. Put a deposit on a custom delivery van. You gonna like it if you smoke it, then support the brand. Most rappers braggadocious, I just tell the truth with what I'm saying. Stay in my lane till I'm paving my own in the game. I told him I don't know about these planes. Unloaded, then they came. He did his time and sent the message. He was brave. A lot of motherfuckers cave every day. Betray their values and they people like they never cared about them. Loyalty is to the grave. To the grave. To the grave. The OG, so nasty a game, been on the paper chasing. Nurture the forest and flavors and all the weed you tasting. My ill of mine was designed for my own empowerment. Determination, devotion to answer the older challenges. Man, it's a lesson when taking losses. Survived a ton of shit that would have broke most of your bosses. Now I'm like, pay me the highest and none of you bodies. For all my homies, heads and medical patients, it's free to try it. Sold seeds, clones, over the globe. Hundreds of thousands of pounds, change your rep. A lot of down already know Nevada County supporting family grows A bunch of paid their bills and survived the decade with one clone I gave my homie seeds Big director, 65 shops flowing to one of the best sellers in true leave Top three there, WA, Vegas changing their names I never got ahead enough but almost had it 
self-made Still managing East Coast and plan to win Handling California Bonfires and mandolins Rolling up shit that stank like the 80s before I blaze Got a lot of kinfolk around the way Ain't seen for days I should ask Beth, Mikey, my G, been MIA Seen him last at 17 when he brought me some champagne When I was 19, he helped me with a 50 pack Had me help count cash in a room with 150 racks Returned the favor back Gave him any work he wanted, then he brought me the Jersey Boys and Freddy Pat. I make him prosper, favors for neighbors, payments often, and spread wealth from California to Boston. Yeah, to Boston. Yeah, that's how I've always done it. What I love about all your stuff is it all brings me back to the mid nineties. Okay. But, a golden uh, era of hip hop. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Alex, you're muted. Is, it's a long song. That was like a three minute song right there. That was dope. I liked it. <laughs> yeah. That was very, very, very old school hip hop feel. Loved it. Yeah. I'm surprised how well that worked over the stream and through my headphones. And yeah, it was very cinematic. <laughs> I was happy that I had good headphones on. <laughs> yeah, man. I was like smoking the rest of my joint. Like, damn, this fucking, this is ill. Nice work, Dan. Hell yeah. yeah. I can tell you put a lot of love and passion into that. Yeah. I wrote that, that on a just like like a dream. Drive. I just had the song on uh, on YouTube and then I figured out I could flip the MP3 off of YouTube, but I was just literally driving, you know, 85, you know, for like six hours and I would just keep going back to the file, resetting the song and then type it on the notes on my phone, you know, and, and wrote that whole shit on that drive. So that was, that was cool. Yeah, hell yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Passionate about the rapping and, and the breeding for sure. You know, Tyson, did you get a chance to chop up about uh, the plants that you grown before I came on? Yeah. Yeah, can, can, can you actually describe yeah, some it. of them in terms of like yeah. uh, while they were growing, kind of structure and things you were noticing, and then kind of the smoke? Before Tyson begins, since I had a little bit less um, experience, but I just want to chime in since I real quick about the Natty Bumpo. Uh, oh, did you I did grew, you grow it? I did. Yeah, I grew. Oh, out, sweet. Uh, the regular Natty Bumpo seeds that uh, John and I got from the regen when we met Dan, I think it was 22. It was 22. Um, and I grew those out indoors two runs in a row. The first one came out awesome, but not as awesome as the second one because I was dying, dialing it in more. I was growing it alongside, I think, seven other elite cuts, including uh, like Dozy Do, Chem D um a sour cut and um i think maybe a blueberry muffin or something along those lines but anyway it definitely was a standout um obviously it was from seed so it had substantial vigor compared to um clones but uh it definitely stood out in terms of size node spacing structure branching um it had the a hell of a stump for a tap root um it naturally opened up and allowed all of the light in after some very low maintenance uh plant with a very high yield um i also shared that with rich and he grew it i believe outdoor against what owen recommended saying that it probably wouldn't finish in time um, he tried it anyway just because it was such a dank plant um, and he had great success and i think uh, after passing it to Tyson, he may have also grown it outdoor and um, beyond me growing it three or four times um, in similar environments, slightly different soils and under different lighting. Uh, it was definitely a top favorite plant of mine over the last couple of years for sure. Um, hell yeah. But yeah, hell yeah. So excellent work on that. It was uh, even Uncle Doobie. Um, you know, he de he described the different nuances of uh, the different flowers that I think Tyson, Rich, and I had. And, you know, he would say, uh, I think mine was a little more OG and 
Tyson um, Riches came out a little bit more chemi, I believe, um, depending on how we grew it, you know. But uh, Tyson, what you, you grew two different cuts of it, right? Um, well, I guess I grew six seeds of it last year. And then, yeah, this year I, I grew two different cuts. I grew your cut and I grew um, the number four cut. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I liked them both, both years. And that was one thing I was going to say about m most of them that I grew was they did really well um, with getting very little mold um, comparatively to other stuff I grew the same years. Um, and I, so I, I grew three Starlink, um, six Natty Bumpo, six of the Nova Star or Supernova, six of the Lemon Sugar Kush, six Double OG Cam, and six Rebel Cookies. And that was last year. Oh, um, and, then, and then this year I grew two of the Double OG Cam, the 17 and the 15, and two of the Natty Bumpo. Um, and this, the Starlink, I, it wasn't my favorite for flower, but it made the best rosin last year. Um, so I, I almost grew it again this year, but I, I just didn't have space. Uh, but I'm so still holding on to the our, to our the best year like. of the Starlink. You know, the our best year of the Starlink was 2021. And do you know, I'm telling you, Owen wasn't here yet, but that that's some of the best herb I ever grew on the in the East Coast. But Nobody's quite convinced yet unless they've grown enough of them because there is a lot of variation. They're not, I wouldn't call it like some stable seed line. There's a lot of different shit in there. Um, but that's cool that you grew six of the lemon sugar kush. Um, there's been a lot of people around the Northeast that have been growing that for years. There's this one guy that buys seeds every year, uh, just randomly in Vermont of all places. And uh, But the lemon sugar kush is really terpy, really terpy and really greasy. And it, it does have like a legit citrus. There's like a citrus sweetness and then there's a gas and then there's kind of like the whole wavelength of in between. And you find the right one that's got most gas, but with citrus and it's like a whiter flower, big, huge bud. There's, there's some really special stuff in there. Um, we actually have a bunch here of the more citrusy kind of terpy ones, which is great, but that's cool that you got to, to grow those. Someone used to call it a loaf of bread on a stick is what they used to call the, the the lemon sugar kush, like the right pheno that you want, which probably not the best for the Northeast. But right. Yeah. I think Owen was texting me that he was going to jump on. Oh, I think you're muted, Peter. I was muted, too. No, no I said he... he uh, he uh, said he'd probably be on around eight. I think that's when he gets. Uh, is it? Is he going home? <laughs> I yeah, when he came bad. on the other night, and he had the grow behind him, and kind of the lights, like the mood lighting changing with like it, it was epic right. to. They were going. I was. I was wishing I was there with him. Yeah, yeah, he's got a cool spot. He he was doing weed deliveries today. Um, he has. He, has, <laughs> he doesn't do that many deliveries, but he went up. Uh, to deliver some weed today to uh shops or yeah to dispensaries um so yeah. actually someone asked uh can you talk about kind of the regulatory differences like what do you like more i assume vermont is uh nicer these days than california yeah i mean there's 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 big differences um you know, it's a pretty controversial topic for me. I mean, I could I could answer any questions. Um, you know, I, I have a licensed farm here in Vermont and I have a licensed farm in California um, in Humboldt County. And, um, you know, the goal is is to just represent our herb and so people can smoke our herb. And <clears throat> when I decided to go legal in California, it was just what's what's a more sure thing? you know, like trying to go legal or trying to like just grow weed and continue to, to, to grow. And I felt that going legal was a better chance for longevity. You know, I, I kind of, I already had a, a genetics company, a seed company. And, um, 
so I kind of made made that choice. And so when that's your goal, it's you know it's a it's a big difference than most people you know I know in cannabis, like the legal side of things. Um, and so I've been trying to do it by maintaining the same value systems the entire time, which doesn't help you get ahead because um, it's so so cutthroat. But um, Vermont's got some things that are great, like um, you know it's a very small state. It's got a very small market. Um, I guess it's got an easier barrier of entry for your average person who would want to maybe test the waters and try to get a business like the smallest tier license is only $700 for an annual license fee. Um, we don't have metric. That's great. Like Owen and I can make an invoice for an order from a dispensary. They're almost all locally owned. So like we have good, strong relationships with them and Hey, what up? What do you want? You know, just explain what we have, send them a digital menu file make an invoice, make a transfer manifest, bring them the weed, you know, every two weeks, we just transfer how much weed we move to who. So it's, it's a lot, it's a lot easier in that way than California for sure. What's up, Owen? What up guys? What's but, going on brother? California is on the road. California is one thing that is to say is there's like 40 million people in California. So it's like, you know, it's just, People blend in with the crowd. I don't know. They're they're both challenging. I like I I'm continuing legal weed because that's what I really believe is the right choice, but I I still hate legal weed. So I don't know. If you had specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but we don't need to get into all that. I'll that was a good overview. I'll I'll say one thing, like I I respect the regulators in Vermont, you know, like, but you know, like they have these it's Politics is like the worst thing in the world. And it's really just about who people are talking to and who can talk to the person and whatever. And that's what I don't like about it because when you're making regulations that are gonna impact people's lives or your whole state, you gotta think about who's behind these subcommittees and whose recommendations are they getting and why is that person giving those recommendations and are they independent because they're just a non-biased person? Do they work for an organization? What does that organization represent? So there's there's a lot of really positive things about the Vermont regulations, and I I give a lot of credit to the regulators for the work they do. I think a lot of stuff they get wrong. I'm actually currently taking the Vermont CCB to the Vermont State um, Supreme Court on a on a issue that I've got going on with them. Um, you know, it's like I I like respect them kind of, but I wish that they would sometimes be more critical uh, about stuff. So sorry, anyway. more more what? logical logic okay you cut out just as you said that word it's all good but uh yeah i think he, he has a specific uh ability to get product to market in california versus vermont they're, they're so like how easy is they're, they're different missions right so like in california you have to have a distribution license i don't have a distribution license i don't have the facilities or the means to get a distribution license but um, I've jumped around to a whole bunch of them and, and the goal for me is to just find the right distributor that has the right resources in play to operate what I need as a third party representative for my brand. Let me do sales marketing and let let my partners grow some of the best herb in Humboldt County um, and just grow more of it and try to keep it in our neighborhood and help our neighbors as we expand. Um, so I, I generally keep about 20 stores in California, but it's seasonal. We do very small batches. Most of our stuff gets sold to wholesale distributors based in LA that sell to other brands and probably change the names. Um, but you know, but we do we do keep relationships with a good couple handfuls of good people. Come here, come and, um, in Vermont, well, it's, come it's, here. It's personal and uh, you know all the dispensaries that we work with are personal relationships that were built organically through meeting people or get introduced or somebody reaching out. And so it is, it's almost a little more like back in the day, 215 era, where like you actually, you know, the owner of the store and you know, their buyers and like, you get to, you know, enjoy the times you get together. And, and I'd say there's, you know, Owen and I had a dispensary owner come here last night to pick up herb. And it's like, it just felt good to be able to have the dude here and show him how the farm works and show him how healthy Owen's got the moms rocking. And, you know, that it's, it's much more personalized in Vermont. Um, but obviously there's a lot of opportunity in California as well. And California is really the, to me, it's the, it's the, the start of all the culture. 
not just cannabis, but so much culture comes from California and New York. So it's like to be able to maintain a presence in such a valuable market and present something that people are recognizing in that market has so much value if we can just do it right, you know? Yeah. That answers the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So someone, uh, actually a couple of people asked about the Blue Dream. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so this Blue Dream cut, there's, uh, you know, I made some hybrids and outcrosses with Blue Dream back in 2011. Um, this one was from some of my earlier OG Chem seeds. So it was an OG Chem male that went into Blue Dream. Um, and then when I did uh, the next year is I grew out those Blue Dream OG Chem seeds um, found these really dense, like crazy flowers that were really crusty and candied flavored. And, um, it's a funny story. I actually had a partner of mine who, who killed a bunch of my males that, that year. And there was this woman, uh, you know, up on the ridge top, um, my buddy and, and his wife, and they each had their own house and they'd been there for a long time. And I used to sell her seeds every year. She loved my seeds. And so she grew like 40 or 50 of those blue dream plants and um, hadn't gotten rid of her males. So I went up and I selected these two males and uh, used those and back crossed it to the Blue Dream clone. And then from there, there's just been a bunch of in crosses. Uh, but I used to sell a lot of those seeds in California. So what it is, it's Blue Dream crossed Blue Dream OG Chem. OG Chem was the male in the line and then a back cross and series of, of selections. And um, yeah, I used to sell a bunch of those seeds in California, you know, you can grow some really big plants with those things. And uh, it's it's pretty much you're either going to find things very consistent with Blue Dream or you're going to find these purple stemmed plants that have like a more of a, you know, candied structure and a denser nug. They do great with everything. Um, I, I got lazy on the packaging and I just called it Blue Dream. Um, but what it really is, is Blue Dream back crosses, you know, back cross and in cross generations and stuff. Um, probably could pop up some pictures of some pretty big plants that people used to grow with those. Um, but yeah, nice, nice herb. And these seeds were pulled out of some stuff from also probably six, seven years ago and just did a repopulation run, um, in a, in a hoop. And, um, I had another, another blue, blue dream line with a, a strawberry diesel in it that I kept going for years. That was pretty much identical to blue dream, but this one is great because the OG chem, there's no real gassiness to this herb, but it just makes, you know, good hash and it has some, some good color to the flower. See if I can pull something up with that. I saw you hold your phone up to the screen earlier. I can pop something up for you real quick. Yeah, yeah. And Owen, what, uh, I can't remember if in our last conversation you talked about uh, some of your favorites from the Rebel Grown. Actually, not just from the Rebel Grown collection, but Dan said you have a a massively huge library. So can you talk about some stuff? Yeah. Some uh, cool, some cool uh, cuts from your vault. <clears throat> yeah, we have like all the the cool kind of classic OGs and sours and diesel and all of this old foundational kind of genetics that I brought up here but at this point like we've made a ton of selections out of Dan's work and other breeders work up here in the northeast and there's there's quite a the little arsenal of, of plants that we have access to to run through again this season um, of Dan's stuff that is my favorite like Dan's OG chem work is really strong, potent cannabis. Like, I don't even care what it tests at. It's just, like, really, really powerful medicine. Um, and it works really well for me. The Natty Bumpo, like, his gassy work is some of the best stuff available on the planet. It's just phenomenal that I get to work with the stuff. The headband line that he was talking about. That Sugar Ray Lemons that I believe you have, like that was the craziest breeding tent walking in that thing this year. The smell just like smacked you in the face so hard, like blinding with this lemon zest smashed to the face. I'm pretty sure I only kept one plant out of 
I don't know, there were a lot in there. One plant that was just exceptional. Um, I'm excited to see what's in that. Um, the the yeah, there's headband, double OG cam, super excited about those. Yeah, so Peter, you've got a couple things. Did, did Peter just pop out for a minute? Looks like it. That's all good. Yeah, like there's a couple things that we sent you, Peter, that uh, that I probably hadn't talked much about. But you have my old uh, Rebel Sour seed line. And um, I haven't had fresh seeds of those for a few years. A lot of people used to grow those seeds. And there's some really good sour dominant stuff in there. Um, the ones that are not as sour dominant are incredible hash makers. Uh, but I really tried to refine that. And um, the seeds that you have are from, um, you know, uh, a bunch of selections on these sours. I only kept two seed plants from it. You know, I went through quite a few and there were two that just had this 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 nose that is just sour as, as most folks know. It just doesn't breed very dominant. You know, you can get vigorous plants and mold resistance out of it, but it's hard to get that turp profile. Um, and so these these I think people are going to be really stuck out. Back when Kevin had Wonderland, um, you know, Kevin used to sell a lot of my seeds. And, you know, Wonderland was the only licensed nursery in the country back then. And you could get some like genetics, at, you know, clones and some Bay Area dispensaries, but not not like what Kevin had going. He had kind of like a collective of all the, the breeders at the time. So he had CSI. He had, you know, my stuff. He had Humboldt Seed Company. He had uh, uh, what was uh, what the hell was the name of their company? They had the Cherry Chem and all this stuff. Anyway, Kevin had all the good Emerald Triangle breeders. And back then, because we were collective members, people could just order whatever they wanted. So Kev would have a list every year from a lot of local people that would just be like, yep, he had your seeds too. Uh, Boneyard, right? Is that who that was? Yep. Um, but anyway, so Kevin every year, just a lot of locals would order my seeds and they could just get whatever they wanted. So like, you know, every year I had this one guy I'd get 900 Rebel Sour seeds every single year. Um, you know, there was this one family, like, you know, three generations, there was like the grandpa, the mom and the son, and they would all order for their different farms. Um, <clears throat> but that rebel sour cut, Kevin, you sell a, lo a lot of those seeds in bulk back in the day. And I feel like this generation is the most refined it's ever been. Um, so, you know, there's going to be some special stuff. And the story to that goes like people know the double OG chem because it won the awards, but the one that first you know, was getting known was the double OG sour because the double OG sour was an OG dominant seed plant, right? And the early OG seed lines were basically Cali Connection um, or, you know, whoever else had some early OGs, but they were just F1 hybrids um, that, that generally didn't have a lot of OG influence in the nose. And so there was just so many people trying to find OG from seed because that's what was going to get people paid and just every year disappointment people like well i grew these big buds it's not not og um in in my neighborhood in california there's some old timers that have been back crossing og for like 12 years and that's what like all their friends like a whole section of the neighborhood would grow this one guy's og stabilized seed line and that's what all their buyers bought but uh yeah the double og sour just has such a great bud to leaf ratio and such rock hard chunky og nugs but they're like whiter and frostier with just you know higher resin output so that that's what we like kind of started off and like the male og sour that was used in that the og you know the the rebel sour the double og sour the double og chem a lot of that shit was just one male that was just so incredible everything that it touched it just got chunkier and bulkier easier to grow more potent and then really did a good job preserving the terps on the the f1 you know, hybrids that came, you know, from the, from the mom side. Um, but yeah. So anyway, like I was saying, you now have the double OG sour and the rebel sour, as well as the double OG chem and the headband line and that butterscotch line. And all those things are, are refined. You know, I've been offering those seeds for years, but this year I think the stuff that you have is, is more refined than what I've been putting out since like, really good F1s. I mean, some of the best seeds that I've ever sold are definitely F1 seeds. And um, 
you know, I, I feel like I'm getting to the point where I can find the traits that I was so stoked about in my F1s where they bred really well as true breeding plants and can bring those out five, six, you know, generations later. So that's, that's kind of in line with the stuff that you have. Do you ever go back to the F1s? Like you've worked it to F5 and then you're like, let me go in a different direction and yeah i try to um you know some of my older seeds weren't stored great you know like i have a i have a refrigerator in california um everything stored great and you know every while i pull stuff out and test it and you know my older stuff is like oh man 15 to 30 percent of this stuff germinates but i i still have another couple hundred to go back um there's definitely stuff that i've tried to do in vitro stuff and given the kind of tissue culture experts and they think that the embryos are just straight up dead um, from older seeds. And that's because back in the day in Humboldt, like you didn't store anything inside. You, you, you didn't store your weed in a barn. It's like everything had to be, you know, outside and buried. Um, you know, some people had nice buried things with like buried septic tanks or bunkers or whatever. But like you can't just fucking have all your weed lying around because if you get raided, you're going to be fucked. And, um, you know, so back in the day, my seeds, I would just, you know, I would have everything in a bunch of Ziploc bags and sometimes vacuum seal stuff. And then I'd have like totes and then I'd have like three or four layers of contractor bags around the totes, um, you know, and then I would just have those, you know, buried in the woods or, or stashed under some stuff. So some of my older, older Humboldt seeds, you know, like they're just, you know, they've either been stored there or in a hot barn. So there's definitely some stuff that's been lost to, to stuff like that. But, you know, that's something I corrected a long time ago as well. Yeah, that's crazy. That's awesome. Do you, do you still like, are there, are there things you bury that you're like, fuck, I couldn't find it? Not weed or seeds or money. Um, okay. I know a lot of funny, you know, money stories of other people, but not me. The the only thing is like, you know, you used to never keep any of your records. Like I remember once I was at like a social event and this one, one grower was telling everybody, he's like, Oh, I've got all the records. I can look and see how much I trimmed every strain. Every single person at the party was like a, you know, humble old timer. And everyone's like, I can't believe you keep that in your house. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Like that's absurd. You know, and he's like, what do you mean? What do you mean? You don't keep records You're like, yeah, fucking woods, you know, because like, what if they come in the middle of the night and you have one notebook that's got all your trimming records, you know? And so then it's like now, you know, learning to be the opposite of that and keep records for, for everything. That's why I still use notebooks, you know? Um, so I've definitely lost notebooks that have music that I wrote or like old soil recipes and, you know, farm notes and things like that. There's this, this one year where like everybody just kept getting raided in my current neighborhood and, you know, like all our friends were getting raided and I had like a big crew. And so every time that they were getting raided, we didn't know if we were going to get raided. So we just had all this protocol and we just keep taking all these like contractor bags with all our notes and everything and just stashing stuff in the woods. So I know there's definitely some stuff that got left behind there for sure. Um, yeah. Ty, what were you smoking out of? Was that a chillum or hold that up again? Yeah. Chillum. Nice. And with double OG cam in it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, there's a yeah, guy but... who makes chillums that I want to get a chillum from. I forget his name. He's on Instagram, but he posts this Jonas Chillum. I so I ha I got this one off Etsy. Well, not this one, sorry. One that was very similar to this. Um uh Renato. I think can't think of his last name right now, but Renato in Italy. And it was a gr an awesome chillum. You know, of course I broke it. I replaced it with a Jonas chillum. I still have the Jonas chillum, but I bought another one from Renato because I like it so much better. What is so it? I is highly it, recommend is this it guy. Clay or ceramic or um yeah it's it's clay yeah 
So wait, I, I, origi I originally got it. Um, I think he's on Instagram as well, but mainly he's on Etsy. Um, R O N A T O. Uh, you know, hold on one second. I gotta look it up. Um, I think it's R. Renato Chillum. Found that blue dream. I forgot what I was doing, but I found this is a picture. I don't know if this will come out. Right, nice. This is one of those blue dream seed plants. This is damn nice. my friend Red Dave. <laughs> yes, yes, peace. But this was a farm that I used to to work on. And the year before we put these haze hybrids, I had these super silver haze hybrids. We put them in these 800 gallon boxes. And it was so stupid because they like took forever to finish and the buds were really thin. And I said, man, if we just grow blue dream in those, we'll grow 20 pounders. So the next year they grew the blue dream from the seed line. And then I told them, I said, you idiot, you should have trained it wide, you know, instead of training it wide, they let it grow tall. And then eventually they just like fell over and they were running fans in the, in the garden to keep them from molding, but they still got like 16, 70, 17 pounds out of those. Um, but uh, yeah, blue dream. Hold on, I, I found this guy. Is that him? I love no. No? No, is that's not him. Um, his, his thing is um, Hashi on Etsy. Hold on, I'm trying to... I think I just shared the link to you. To you. All right, hold on. Let me go back to. Uh, but yeah, H A S H E E in Imperia, Italy. Oh, uh, yeah. There we go. And I got a Jonas Chillum because one of Rich's friends sells him um the the old man on the mountain um oh wait sorry i was on the yeah that's the guy yeah <laughs> it's going to have an explosion in sales good i hope so <laughs> Yeah, no, I want to pick one up. So Dan, what uh what are you <clears throat> what are you gonna work this season? Like what's uh what directions are you gonna explore? Too many. Um Owen was just showing you guys this one one breeding tent that he's got in his living. Oh wait, sorry, Owen, do that again. Owen's gonna was totally spacing out. Yeah. Owen was gonna make some babies. Yeah, there's there's a couple of different things that we're doing right now. Uh, one is uh, from that, and and then turn the camera sideways. Oh yeah, all right, I see. Ah, oh, this is what you posted pictures of before, right? I know. T turn it uh like a TV. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's gonna be sick. So so check it out. So um we found this this one island mountain headband clone that I really like that we're putting into production. Um and it, was, it was a seed plant in 2022. That's that's the plant in the back corner right there. But to me, that's like to me, I think it's gonna be a great long-term production keeper from this seed line. And um we put that clone in a breeding area with the double OG chem pollen. And so we made the, you know, Island mountain headband <laughs> one, awesome. four, three. So anyway, the Island mountain headband crossed with double OG chem. And mm. I came up with a really dope name for it. I was going to call it Hill Ridge. Um, but Joel from, um, from Ital foundations, he already has a string called Hill Ridge. Um, so I was thinking about calling it Hillionaire, but anyway, <laughs> of those seeds so so we popped those island mountain headband crossed with double og chem and wanted to test them out and in cross them and then we have a doc 15 clone in there to back cross to the double og chem 
And then we have the Island Mountain Headband 143 clone to back cross to the mom. Um, and then I think there's maybe another one or two things. That's the Doc 15. So this will make basically the F2 of whether it's Hill Rich or Hillionaire, the, the headband cross double OG chem, and then a back cross to both parents. And I think Owen just done did it because that just made a lot of seeds. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try any of those. We all we all witnessed the moment. The deed has been when done. Thousands when thousands of babies group. were made. Yeah. <laughs> And then, you know, our plan for that is we're going to keep those males the next five to seven days and pull them out of there. And, uh, and then we're reversing the double edge chem right now. Again, we're, we're reversing the doc 15 and pollinating some stuff with that. And that's, that's pretty cool for, you know, most of the breeding and the seeds are produced outdoors, uh, you know, during the natural season, but to, to have some space and do a couple winter projects, you know, once those are done, we'll, throw something else in there and move on to the next one. So we can do some small scale, you know, year round selections. And it's, it's good for us to test our genetics indoors. Like I don't grow a lot of indoor, I don't smoke a lot of indoor. Um, but I used to grow, you know, organic soil grown indoor. And so just having little tester areas where we can take, you know, the plants from our fields that did really well outdoors here, do good in Humboldt and see whether they have any issues or whether they're stable, whether they're sensitive to light or whatever. So that's that's been cool to have that. Yeah, uh, that'd be satisfying. <laughs> I think your setup looks very satisfying. And how how many acres of outdoor do you have? Like, what what's your? Uh... So here I'm allowed to grow <laughs> up to twenty thousand square feet, which is a little yeah. under half acre, but it's also by plant count. So in Vermont, I can grow either. 2,500 plants or 20,000 square feet. So is it the greater of or the lesser of? <laughs> it's, no, it's uh, my internet might have froze on you. It's one or the other, right? So you can either choose the square footage or the plant count, um, whichever one. And so we've been going with the plant count, but honestly, we, di we didn't even use it all last year. Um, you know, my property is more mountainous than it is agriculture. And so while there is agriculture area and like an old horse field, um, you know, in areas that I've been building the the soil since we had hemp and we're starting to really build a good living soil and cover cropping and, you know, um, in an upper parcel, which had been converted to ag, it's still like mountainous. Um, so, you know, finding space for 2,500 full, full term plants, like we haven't even figured out what the right strategy is for that here. Is Owen, is Owen hard on that one? Is he going to solve it for this season? Oh. <laughs> I Owen, you know. attention. I missed it. But yeah, maybe <laughs> whatever he tells me to do. I you're you're, you're going to solve problems. You're the problem. Owen's the pretty man. good at solving problems. You know, like most of what I do is solving <laughs> problems. You know, like that's what I've done for a long time is I'm just solving problems. And Owen's great because he solves a lot of my problems sometimes. Um, but no, all it is is like, you know, if we space out plants properly, like that's a good, good chunk of plants and we want to grow them properly. Um, but, you know, a lot of what we grew from that, we chose to grow in the smaller pots because we just didn't have the the space and tillable field. There's like, there's another weird law where you can grow on two connected parcels, but you're maxed out at two. But like some farms are like, have multiple different parcels with different spans. And so I have three total parcels and I can only use two of them but like the one that we do not grow wheat on I used to have two acres of a hemp field you know so I had like a hemp field with like a lot of effort into pulling up rock and amending it and bringing in all types of crazy compost and manures and and cover cropping it but it's higher elevation so there's there's a there's better mold resistance up there uh, because of the the wind but there's so much wind that it would like batter your flower and it's only good for kind of hash production unless it's covered. So we could easily fit the plants there, but they wouldn't be the same quality, you know, as, as the lower fields. And then uh, on top of that with the state, unless I merge that into my other parcel number and it has the same span number, I can't even use it, which doesn't make sense. Cause it's, I can walk next, you know, it's right there, but 
That's like, cool though that you can do hemp production and high THC production like <laughs> on your same property and. Well, also I'm a little confused about how that works because I I didn't renew my hemp license after 2021. I was thinking about getting it again because like that field, for instance, we don't have to do anything. We could just roto till that field as is. We could throw some cover crop on it and we could direct sow hemp seed, like actual hemp seed. I have plenty of hemp seed, you know? And so we could do that just to like kind of see what happens and then just harvest it, strip it, store it, figure out what to, what to use. Just like make some, make some cool medicine. Maybe we could do some cool shit, but you know, having the bandwidth and resources for it, you know, we'll, we'll see. Owen's going to make that happen too. I mean, if we keep it simple like that, you know, like we're not going to have a budget to. Once I like optimize all this space, like I'm game for going as big as we can go. You know, we still got some work to do and it can just get better and better and better. And it's going to be fun. Yeah. We're, we're in good shape for this year. We got really, really great, healthy moms. Owen's Owen's got shit rocking down there. Like really healthy moms, probably the healthiest that they've, they've been on this farm. Um, and you know without a lot of infrastructure you know whether we just use our own kind of cold frames that we build like we'll have a well organized nursery and everything you know I'll, you know timelines for every fucking thing you know with farming is tyson could probably you know educate us way more on on farming than i am he's like a real deal farmer um but farming is all about your timing you can't miss timing if you're a farmer and like that's that's the biggest most crucial thing and so we're just this year we're just dialed. Everything is, is ready to go. Do you do any light depth too, or is it just all full term? We did a little bit the first year last year we didn't, but we planted all the hoops up um, for full term. And this year it's like, we can, we, we can like my whole thing is like, I don't like smoking light depth. Um, Vermont's market is interesting. Like it's so small. And so, you know, we have some, some little greenhouses that actually, you know, have, and we're, we're thinking about it. It's just, it's like the way that it would work in California, if you have depth, it's gone. You know what I mean? Like the market gets dry now, depending on the year and, you know, depth's going to have a higher price. It's a, it's a big, but in, in Vermont, there's no such thing as like a bulk wholesale market. There is no bunch of buyers that need, thousands of pounds you know there's like 73 stores and there's a 14 percent cannabis tax and the market is largely visitors so like the retail market is very small the only reason that we would grow a dep is if we tried to grow the right amount that we could like harvest it cure it process it and then get it into the market in the right way and sell through all of it right before our earliest harvested outdoor is cured trimmed processed gone through compliance and so if we did do a debt it would be it would it wouldn't be big you know be maybe like 260 footers or something it's interesting alex or uh tyson any questions or commentary alex you are muted and now very frozen frozen how many people did you do you have watching this this thing peter uh right now it's uh like 240 something i think before it was higher wow no that's that's more people than i thought it was that's that's a good audience <laughs> they got nothing to do on what is it thursday night Yeah, I like uh good place to be on a Thursday. We're we're uh yeah, no, I like that. It's like and it's around the world, right? It's like it's cool that we're all at like I'm kind of right at the like beginning of dinner with kids and then like you guys are at a totally different time. I always forget when people are on the east coast and I'm like yapping away and I'm like, oh shit, it's like one in the right. morning there. And then I feel bad. Uh Right. Oh, no, I, did I, love a, it, man. I did a couple of your shows a few years ago that started at like 8 p.m. on the on the West Coast. So, you know, we, 
till we started at like 11 and then it was like two it was like 2 30 in the morning and i was like super faded and i just i realized yeah. i was like faded compared to everyone else. well because for me too i try to sneak stuff in like after my kids go to bed but then on the east coast it's like super late no this yeah we could do more cool. Do you, uh, so can we get the two thumbs up on the chillum? And by the way, what are you smoking out of that right now? Doc 15. Nice. So what are, what are you going to grow uh, this year? Have you been thinking about it? I'm still thinking. I'm, I was going to ask these two guys what I should be growing. You know, well, you know, we should send you a list to choose from. We should send you a, a crazy list. I'm sure. Oh, you know what? Uh, people, you, are you down to do a giveaway of a pack? Yeah. Well, like sure. within the U.S., we'll make it easy. We could do that. All right. So why don't you pick something and tell us what it is while I queue up. For the seeds? Yeah. I almost forgot that. But I did see it when someone uh, said it in the comments. Uh what kind yeah, of what giveaway? How are, you, how are you picking the winner? So it's a random drawing, but you, it, how about let's do hashtag rebel grown. And I'm... then people put in hashtag rebel grown. And then I just hit like draw and it picks a winner. And it's super easy. Um, anyway, from the seeds, like I was saying earlier, just. You know, I know I'm just stoned and rambling, but yeah, there's there's some stuff on that list um, that is is definitely new to you. Owen was talking about the Sugar Ray Lemon, and so what that is is it's um, it's double OG Chem crossed with a lemon sugar, sugar Kush. So it's a lemon sugar Kush male selected 2018, and um, from some F3 lemon sugar Kush. And 2018 was a really good year for us. You know, I mean, I guess if you want to do those. So. 2018 was a really good year. And our weed won a bunch of awards, made a bunch of really good hash. And it was kind of an open pollination on um, on the double OG chem females from a, a really great generation. And then we grew a bunch. Or no, this was 2017. 2017. 2018, we grew a bunch of the you know, double OG chem lemon sugar in Humboldt, we grew like a bunch of them. And that weed was just crazy because, you know, it's just the double OG chem has so much impressive stuff in the, in the traits, just like, it's just so resinous and, and vigorous and gassy. And, um, and that was, that was really, really some amazing herb. And, um, and then I didn't, didn't get into those seeds for a while. And then the last couple of years, you know, did a couple of open pollinations, but from all the, the seeds that we, had in these little breeding areas there's you know several thousand females for sure uh between the seeds and i would say that the one standout plant from that sugar ray lemon was probably in my top three plants just individual seed plants that we saw last year that thing was like just a straight tower and it was so greased up there were there were actually quite a few there were there were a few different things and i i rate everything in a star system like one two three stars and then like i mentioned earlier put the notes on the bag but that one plant, I've been pulling seeds out of it and giving that to like friends that I really want to see grow something special. So that shit um, is cool. And for the the seeds that you have is a mix between that plant and um, a couple others. What's cool about the way that that we did it is like Owen and, and me and the team have just like a pretty decent list of all the different. Um, let me pull this shit up all the different like seed lines and then different people can kind of put in notes as we like store things and figure out what's, what's for sale, what's good enough for sale, you know, like who, you know, are these for testing Are these, you know, vetted enough, whatever. And then you can go through and every single seed plant, you know, and clones are, are all cataloged. So I can just go through and pull up, you know, that line and uh, sugar Ray lemon. And I can see the seed plants. There's one, two three four five and then out of like one two three four five six seven eight nine there's nine that we kept seeds from there's a bunch we didn't even harvest and then there's five that we're offering the seeds of those specific ones and i can bust down all the notes 
two star frosty vigor tall big calyx lots of branches big nose gas citrus mold resistant boom so like those are the seeds that that you're gonna get and that's what's cool i don't think i've quite refined my shit in a way this this organized before um you know generally when i when i tell people here here's what you're going to expect there's a lot of different things you might find but it's cool to have this shit narrowed down that's awesome all right so we're gonna so are we gonna do a giveaway you of uh the sugar ray lemon yeah that's what that's what i was saying yeah use that one okay so we have got it my eyes are so bad we have 65 you people so far. You, don't, you don't have to do like a hashtag thing you know well this is actually the easiest for me to do which is why i'm doing it it's already done Dave. Right. it happened in the chat like crazy <laughs> yeah the chat the everyone in the chat is typing in hashtag rebel grow and then all i have to do is click draw it picks the winner for us and then right they on. can get in touch with you all yeah, right, cool. so here we go. So we have uh, 60, all right, five more seconds, 60, all right. We are now at 70 entries, uh, five, four, three, two, one, 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 zero. All right. And just pick somebody random. And you, you, US only, make it easy on Dan, which I said in the beginning. Oh my gosh. Forget about it. Do you want to? Do you want to see who the winner is? Oh my gosh! You want to see the winner? Then forget about say, it. Yeah. Then forget about it. Really win. All right. So forget about it. Can you let us know that you're still in the chat? And uh, if you're on Instagram, can you DM Dan? What What's the Rebel Grown Instagram? Do the seed one. So it's just Rebel Grown Seeds with the underscores. Rebel so. underscore Grown underscore Seeds yeah and then uh can they email you too can we give out your email address or just, just to do the info at rebelgrown.com and i'll get i'll get okay that. so I'm putting it forget the about it. what a great great name great name for a winner that's great so forget about it let us know that you're still here sugar ray Lemon. otherwise we're gonna have to pick a new winner oh no yeah, by the way, someone asked <laughs> if this was a prototype, which it is. Uh, someone on in Instagram was talking about their prototype, and it made me want to bust mine out. Old school. Uh, oh, there we go. All right, forget about it. Cool. All right. There he is, or she is. Forget about it. All right, cool. All right. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go hang out with her. Okay. Can you say hi? And uh, sh can, can we tease out a, uh, a Rebel Grown series? Yeah, I mean, I was always, you know, happy to do it. It's just more of, um, of sticking with a schedule of when to do it. The one that we did with Jesse and Jackson, that was fun. You know, that was great. And it's like me and me and those dudes, it's so funny. Like whenever any of us talk to each other, I feel like we just end up talking for like four hours, which is, I think, pretty much what that that show on your channel was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we like long form. How, how about we designate Owen to keep on top of making that a reality? You know, my one buddy. You know, it's like real trendy. Everybody does does podcasts and stuff, and um, I don't I don't listen to podcasts. But anyway, my one buddy was saying, you know, you should do some some stuff like that, and I'm like, well, you know, Peter's got this thing. You just jump on there whenever, but you got to keep it interesting, have, have like topics, you know, that are gonna have people captivated enough to to be down. Sounds like you already have that going, don't you? It's cool. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, j for me, it's always like if you can capture being a fly on the wall when you, Jackson, and Jesse are just like shooting the shit, it, like you guys will bring a conversation in an interesting direction. 
I mean, obviously having like a couple topics to be like of the many things we may talk about. We're going to hit on this and this. Okay, wait, ah, stop pulling this pipe right. apart. Me and Jesse were, were talking today a little bit just about trying to plan ahead and make sure that we have each other's genetics to test out and see where they kind of, you know, make sense to, to fit in and blend together. Um, he, the last couple of times he gave me seeds, I don't know if like either of us wrote down what they were, but there's this one, one thing that he has, especially, I forget which one it is, but um, it's one of the black dog, you know, something hybrids, but I saw Craig and, and his wife from Alpenglow. They're a, a small farm in Southern Humboldt. Whatever it was that they showed me a couple years ago from his stuff is incredible. Um, and their stuff is- he, he, He's doing epic work like advocacy wise in that community. Right. You know, me and Jesse have a song together too. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it's called cantaloupe soup can we play that uh next time cantaloupe soup Mommy, i fixed it oh thank you you fixed the pipe oh no not so much i think you mostly but all right well let's uh are we gonna eat dinner yes we're gonna eat dinner all right well i appreciate you guys and uh I'm psyched. Uh, I, I'm hopefully coming back east uh, in the next month or so. So hopefully I'll see some of you guys when I come back. Those are scissors. No, let's not touch the scissors. <laughs> All right. Enjoy your dinner. Thank you. And everyone have a good night. Thanks for having me, Peter. Right, it's good seeing you guys.